it's funny, you know. I think they sh I think they should lean lean them while you can, but I think hold the cards to make it a thing. I think part of the beauty of that is that it was so unexpected and kind of so different from what they were kind of doing that it really stood out. Um, so I think they kind of like should capitalize off of it and probably like run that run that back and, and figure that out what that what, what the kind of hook was. Maybe relooking at some of the old characters that you know you've got a, a slew of IP within the McDonald's ecosystem that are probably ready to be tapped. <laughs> Hey everybody, I'm Brandon Resnick, VP of Marketing at WeWork, and I'm on Behind the Brand with Brian Elliott. What's up everyone? Welcome to another episode of the show. Brandon, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Glad to be here. Excited. I usually ask my guests, how did you get this job? How did I get this job? Uh, through a series of interesting <laughs> events. Uh, through kind of working my you know connections uh, through uh, my previous role and responsibilities and finding a really great person who kind of brought me along on the journey to this company and since then through a kind of series of uh, different uh, interesting kind of uh, you know inner workings at the company I found my way into this incredible position so let's roll the clock back let's go back in the chronology let's take it way back to young Brandon uh, maybe you know uh, elementary school middle school high school what were you thinking about on a career path? And I, with context, the reason I ask this is because, uh, you know, if you are watching this show on YouTube, for example, instead of listening, uh, I can go to the comments and I get a lot of comments like, hey, I'm just graduating from high school. Or, I'm just coming out of college, trying to find my passion, trying to find my path. What advice do you have for me? And I'm always curious about how people who have found their path or are or, or mid path or are crushing it. Like, what were they thinking in the beginning? What were the signals? What did you want to be when you grew up? No, it's a great question. It's one that I think looking back, it makes a lot of sense, but kind of in the moment you had no idea. Mm -hmm. I had truthfully no real direction in terms of what I wanted to kind of aspire to. And it definitely wasn't being a marketing professional. I don't think any child comes, you know, in, in elementary school, like that's not your career day of choice typically. Maybe now with Gen Z and maybe kind of some of the younger folks, maybe they're coming and looking at a Gary Vee or a Brian Elliott and saying kind of that may be the model. But for, for me back in the, uh, the 90s and in early 2000s, that wasn't the case. Um, but for me, I think part of my journey has been kind of this bit of a jack of all trades, looking at kind of the art and science of things. I think from a kind of English perspective and kind of your kind of core subjects, uh, English, social studies, I kind of always excelled and I loved the storytelling aspects of kind of the, the kind of more liberal arts and kind of uh, those aspects. Yeah. I also kind of really excelled at math and science uh, and I could do those really, really well as well. And I wanted to always find a place that kind of balance those two things that I felt kind of equally as good at. And I think through kind of, you know, going to school kind of undeclared and undecided, um, I think ultimately one of the paths and taking kind of a few courses and trying to kind of pressure test what that looked like, I found advertising and I kind of recognized pretty quickly that it was kind of the perfect marriage of the kind of more kind of art and science that I kind of was looking for in a profession. And I thought, yeah, I could do that. I looked at that and said, yeah, that seems like it has all the makings of what I want to kind of aspire to be. Yeah. What, what did your parents do? My dad was a physical education and health uh, teacher in the, proudly in the Philadelphia school system. Awesome. And my mom uh, worked uh, kind of a, a bunch of jobs, but it is essentially kind of a, a doctor's assistant now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So definitely not the, was not the kind of family trade that I got into, but I think a lot of like the morals and values that my parents kind of instilled upon me definitely kind of helped uh, steer me in that direction. I think they always put a real value on education. Uh, and they always kind of really, you know, you know, put, push me to kind of really excel in those fields. And I think I wanted to find something that I could do within the business curriculum. And I think this was kind of the perfect marriage of what I wanted and also what they thought was kind of the, the, the right thing for a, for a kid in the 90s and 2000s to kind of you know, work towards. Mm -hmm. And what brands were you thinking about? Like you think you're kind of aspiring advertising. You know, one of my favorite shows of all time is Mad Men. You know, I look at that era of the... I guess it's the 40s, 50s, and 60s, the classic Mad Men advertising. I mean, uh, good and evil for different reasons. You know, the misogyny and the uh, heavy drinking and yeah. the... Uh, Bar you know, carts. Uh, not so great. Um, yeah. But the other part of it, you know, like the, the real uh, classic tried and true advertising model, super fun to watch, at least in, in that sort of biographical. But what brands were you looking at during the time? Yeah, it's funny, you know, one of the things I should, I should say, like one of the signals, but going back to your earlier question that I kind of always looked at is, I was the kind of kid who just 
love to wake up and this is going to sound insane but actually thumb through if you remember like the circulars that would come every sunday in the sure. newspaper yeah and really that to me was almost interesting to see kind of how these companies were kind of actually marketing themselves and looking at some of the classic you know kind mm -hmm. of media channels that i was kind of consuming as a kid uh be it nickelodeon or mtv and some of these kind of iconic brands that really found this kind of niche amongst a specific demographic and really had really smart advertising. I think I looked at that as a kid and as I kind of got a little bit older and recognized what they were doing and really just gravitated towards kind of the, the ad portions of these and, and really found that kind of culture and kind of the creative aspects of those things just super exciting. But going back to, you know, in terms of brands that I kind of looked at and, and really respected, I mean, obviously, you know, when, when you're, when you're a, a kid and kind of looking at those things, I think you look at the Don Drapers of the world and kind of what they were able to do with, with certain brands. But for me, a brand like a Nike really who established themselves and had a sh true stronghold on culture for so, so long um, as a part of my upbringing was just a huge influence in kind of what and what kind of great looked like at the time. Um, you've got other brands that did really, really smart things too, I think, over that time. When you look at kind of what a McDonald's did with Happy Meals and mm -hmm. really trying to figure out um, a way to kind of get into an audience's mindset and their kind of buyer and look and say kind of how do we really influence that person making the decision as well as the person who's asking to go. And that kind of balance of things is something that I kind of always respected and kind of thought just, um, you know, was, was just incredible. I also kind of worked for in, in college, one of the professors that I had um, kind of helped, you know, worked was that kind of madman person, right? They were from, they were tried and true kind of 1960s madman style kind of Y&R classic agency style. Mm -hmm. um, and he went on and, and helped kind of Ted Turner start CNN and some of the broadcast things. And a lot of what he was talking to in his curriculum were those old iconic brands. When you look at some of the, that like Sanka coffee, like why is the decaf coffee pot orange? Well, they made a decision to brand that thing orange and mm -hmm. wanted to kind of drive that association with their brand and decaffeinated coffee. And he was kind of part of that original kind of strategic team when you think about classic marketing to really drive associations in that way. And I just think that was super inspirational for me to kind of think about these iconic things that we take for granted now and understand so regularly. Somebody way back when decided that that was going to be a thing. And yeah. That's always just exciting. Yeah. It kind of set for, cut from the same cloth here because uh, uh, one of my favorite marketing professors, he was a Levi's guy. So like he was uh, helping Levi's in the early days and, you know, in the eighties, nineties, maybe most probably 80s and 90s, like Levi's was it, right? And there was this place called Miller's Outpost, which is like a, a super big retailer out here on the West Coast. And he was a big part of that. And then another uh, professor was at Nabisco. And um, talking about art and science, he really inspired me. Uh, I'm, I'm probably not as good as you are in uh, math and sciences, but at least I have interest in it. And he, he was my statistics professor. And he was the guy that worked at Nabisco that would work out the standard deviation of uh, chocolate chips per cookie. And uh, he would, you know, work with the um, manufacturing to make sure that there's exactly, you know, plus minus, you know, a percentage or two of chocolate chips, exactly the same amount in each cookie. And uh, he drove home the importance of analytics and t statistics. And that's what kind of gravitated me towards advertising. Um, for those who don't know, you know, I've done quite a bit of that in my previous life at the studios on the client side. But yeah, um, tracking things and analytics and measuring and, um, you know, ROAS, uh, lifetime value, CAC, all those acronyms that we love to uh, look at. Yeah, I'm, I'm sort of in that same camp. Uh, you also mentioned McDonald's. And it's sort of top of mind to me because McDonald's lately is killing it on social media. Are you paying? Just talking about, I was just literally not an hour ago having the same conversation upstairs. It's amazing. Let's talk about it a little bit. I mean, to me, the whole Grimace challenge, it's just like, yeah, it's mind blowing. They're killing it. Absolutely crushing. Just the Grimace, the celebrating Grimace's birthday. Like, you know, when you're in this industry, you become a, a really astute observer of brands yeah. doing great things. And I think if you're good, that's what you do. And, and a lot of folks in the industry, you know, you come in to work and that's what you kind of talk about over the water cooler. And it's exciting to see brands doing, you know, I was fortunate to be a part of some of those cool things that happened, I think, back in my, over my kind of time at, at my previous life in Vader Media and things like that. But yeah, I think like you kind of become really astute at kind of looking at these incredible brands, big brands doing really, really disruptive, interesting things. Like when I was in college, I remember, you know, Burger, Burger King did the subservient chicken. I still remember that doing <laughs> that kind of case study 
work in college about this kind of incredible new kind of activation that this company was going to, Burger King was going to do online. You get to interact with and type on your keyboard, and it was completely groundbreaking. Today, McDonald's and other brands are doing super kind of disruptive, innovative things, and I think the grimace kind of takeover and, and birthday situation with their with the meal was just absolutely awesome and yeah. just got just a groundswell of people behind it. Is that a Wyden and Kennedy thing? I think that's where it came from. I heard. I wouldn't doubt it. Sounds about right. But the, the other magical part is, and I'm sure it was premeditated, but the whole UGC thing, right? It's like, you know. This is the, the biggest blessing and curse you could probably ever ask for as a brand. Um, I've been watching a lot of content, whether or not the, that the whole TikTok situation was premeditated or not, and whether or not they were kind of playing the hand there or just kind of like, we're going to just kind of follow the follow course here and let these kids do what they do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it might be a little bit of both. Who knows? But that's that's kind of where the magic happens is somewhere between uh, I'm scared to death about what the impl implications and I'm super excited because this thing is going viral and we might get credit for it. Right. Like back in the day, I remember, you know, you, it's funny, like you, you'd have a professor always talking about like the the epitome of success. You know, this was in the uh, when, I, when I was in school back in the in 2000s it was like the epitome of your success was if you can make it onto late night TV, like that's when you've made it. That's when your thing has, has hit cultural zeitgeist and you are in the, in, the, in the throes of what it means to be kind of in someone's mindset if, if you're on late night. Jay Leno is talking about it or Conan or someone. Conan or Jay Leno or, or Letterman or whatever it is. Now it's like if, if you're that thing on TikTok, like that's it. Like that is the zeitgeist. That's what people are looking at. Um, yeah. And I think the evolution of that is really cool. And, you know, kind of my I was I worked on a, a program back in back in um, probably 20. 12, 2013, no, it was probably 2014, actually, um, with General Electric, one of our clients at, at VaynerMedia at the time. Um, and it was right when kind of Vine was the, the new kid on the block. It was really, mm -hmm. it, was the hot, it was the hot thing. It was, you know, it, it thought it was going to be the TikTok of the day almost. And we yeah. got to work in this really incredible program called Six Second Science. Um, started out as just some content of science experiments on, on TikTok and, or on, on Vine, rather. And it, it absolutely blew up. Uh, and it became something that, everybody starts to replicate, 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 replicate. And we use that obviously to kind of create a much bigger campaign, but it was, you know, it was really cool to see kind of that program get picked up in a similar capacity and be an ad age and in places like that. Um, and as kind of somebody who studied marketing, it was like just, that was a moment in my career that I kind of look back on. I'm like, wow, that was kind of what I always thought good and great looked like at the time mm -hmm. and, and having kind of not done it, but you know, been in that place was, was pretty cool. But yeah, McDonald's has been absolutely kind of on a tear. Um, uh, just in, I think the grimace thing and kind of letting him kind of go go wild and I think that speaks to a lot of how brands are kind of letting their guard down these days is like a huge I think trend to kind of have that um, you know kind of less pristine kind of look and polish and kind of really mm -hmm. having fun with it and getting people kind of bought in on, on having fun with the brands that they kind of love and, and kind of are attached to yeah and um, getting a piece of that pie to me is, is huge and you know, Burger King's doing a good job of that, of the two. We were just kind of talking upstairs about this and the kind of new campaign with the, the, the you rule aspect and the kind of jingles and songs and stuff, I think have been kind of fun to kind of see progress too. Yeah. So let's weigh in, let's take it just a little bit further across the end zone. So do you think McDonald's should double down on Grimace? Like, you know, Gen Z, even Gen Y, they probably don't even know who Grimace is, right? Grimace was this really weird, almost scary, yeah, was, you know, like, uh, what's that um, Disney movie, uh, Pixar? Uh, sorry, it's uh, Monsters, Inc. Oh, He's Monsters almost like Inc. a Monsters, Inc. character. Like, you'd find him hiding in your closet. <laughs> like, this blob, like, uh, just weird, obscure character that everyone kind of forgot about. Um, but should they double down on Grimace? Um, should they expand the line? Should they come out with, uh, like, uh, plush dolls? Should they, like, what should they do? It's funny, you know. I think they sh I think they should lean lean them while you can, but I think hold the cards to make it a thing. I think part of the beauty of that is that it was so unexpected and kind of so different from what they were kind of doing that it really stood out. Um, so I think they kind of like should capitalize off of it and probably like run that run that back and, and figure that out what that what, what the kind of hook was. Maybe relooking at some of the old characters that you know you've got a, a slew of IP within the McDonald's ecosystem that are probably ready to be tapped so like. You know, I'm trying to like the hamburger, hamburger. And that's where I went. It's a terrifying character, though. If you look at that hamburger's face, it's like terrifying. He's like one of the monkeys from the old like Wizard of Oz, of flying monkeys, like just bizarre looking. You've got a criminal stealing hamburgers. I mean, that's like 
the, the, the situation at hand. You know, I don't yeah. know. If, like maybe you don't want to exactly be like advertising that, but like, yeah. I don't know in some ways, like there's a lot of like baked in nostalgia, I think for a lot of millennials. Yeah. And I think that from the millennial side, it, you tap in like a lot of brands and a lot of, you know, culture right now is, is, is doing the, the throwback thing. Like everything is yeah. a remake of a song or a sample of a song. I think them to capitalize off of the kind of that nostalgia aspect as so many brands are trying to do, I think is smart and doing it in a way that feels very kind of youthful and fun for people who are like, what the hell is this thing? And it just seems kind of weird and bizarre. That's okay. Maybe the hamburger uh, turns over a new leaf and instead of stealing things, he like starts giving things away like a la Mr. Beast. It's like he, he'll do these uh, social uh, experiments, right? Where he's giving a, someone in need, you know, like, uh, stack of hamburgers or something. Exactly. Yeah, I think it could be. Cool. I think it could be cool. I think there's a lot. There's a lot to unpack there. I think like the sweating of these old nostalgic assets, and a lot yeah. of brands are returning to that. Like if you look at even like I was just actually part of the conversation upstairs is if you look at kind of Burger King's kind of an evolution of their brand identity, it's it's largely a throwback to kind of the nostalgic era of Burger King, right? You've got the classic Burger King logo that kind of I grew up with. That was you know the brown interiors. It's kind of like Burger King sandwich between the two and. That kind of, I think, aspect is is making a kind of real comeback hard in, in, in culture, and that culture extends into brands, which often it does. It's how music is evolving. It's how a lot of movies are evolving, television, et cetera. That all kind of reflects the same kind of aspects of where things are at right now, and I think brands are just kind of following suit there. Okay, speaking of another sort of brand reboot turnaround, Mark Zuckerberg. Zuckerberg yes. has somehow... You know, yes, from like most hated man in the world to like cool dude, bro, like knuckles. See you at the I mean, jujitsu gym. Jiu-jitsu, yeah. I mean, I think it always What's... helps when you got an enemy. I mean, listen, like when you've got kind of like it's classic kind of in terms of storytelling, you got good and evil. I think, mm-hmm. you know, for a while like that, you know, some people thought he was like evil. It was like, oh, this guy is, you know, ruining our kids, the screens and da 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 like, oh my God, like what's happening? The data, the Cambridge Analytica. And for a while, like he had a target on his back. Then all of a sudden, a new villain kind of emerged that people mm-hmm. all of a sudden kind of started saying like, what's going on with Twitter? Like, oh, the Elon thing. And I think all of a sudden you've got kind of got somebody to kind of counterbalance that and it becomes a bit of a different, um, you know, your, your kind of lens on those things kind of differs. He's also kind of done some smart personal branding things, I think, to kind of maybe get out of that get out of that situation but it's been, uh, it's been <laughs> yeah. an interesting turn of events turn turnaround story for sure yeah so maybe there's some lessons there to extract i mean it's super literal on the nose but like the accusations against mark and a few of them uh are are well founded for a reason you know uh the cambridge analytica thing the the political stuff that you know is factual we know uh, there's some, you know, dirty business going on there for sure. We don't know all the facts, but uh, certainly there's, uh, accountability, but that said, people would say, you know, he's, uh, not human. He's more robot. He's, you know, not empathetic. He's out of touch. He's like this, you know, guy with the most money in the world. And he, he couldn't care less about you and your children, by the way. And then you find him, uh, out doing very human things like surfing or, uh, what does he do? Not kite surfing. It's um, foil surfing. Yeah, foil surfing. Yeah. He's uh, and then, tearing you know, up. and then you uh, see him uh, learning Chinese with his uh, wife who is of Chinese heritage. And you get the idea like, oh, he's, yeah, I mean, sure. It's in his best interest to spread the word over in China. But at the same time, that's kind of cool that he's learning his wife's language yeah. and getting in touch with that culture. And then you see him getting in shape on the jujitsu mat and, you know, kind of doing more human things. The lesson here is, you know, whatever the criticism is, maybe you flip it on its head and you do the opposite. You, yeah. Okay. Okay. I'll show you how human I am. Yeah. I think, I think the human aspect is important. I think like people want to, you know, look at the, some of the presidential candidates we've had, like people like relatability people, mm-hmm. like, you know, that's something that clearly like when you have that connection and you can kind of see that yourself and that person, you know, even beyond the circumstances of his financial kind of wealth at this point that he's accumulated. Like, I think mm-hmm. it really helps to kind of desensitize people to, to those things and kind of make them feel a little bit bought in that he's just a person. Um, yeah. And yeah, it's kind of been interesting, I think, to, to kind of watch that unfold and, you know, to just kind of see kind of like how they've evolved their own and, you know, you know, the, the success that he's had kind of even in the most recent re- weeks with threads and kind of the launch of, of, of that as a platform, as a kind of complete counterbalance to think those things, I think is, 
you know, been really interesting. And, and just the storylines that have come out coming out of the threads uh, piece have been really interesting that, like, you know, were a bit unexpected, I think, from my perspective. What are you hearing about threads? Because, I, I, of course, I joined it. I'm observing and I have a toe in the water. I'm, you know, I'm a practitioner. I'm fig- trying to figure it out. What are your early thoughts? I think it's in the right now. I think it's in the figuring out phase. I think it's. I think a lot of times, like having seen this pattern, like, you know, I, I, I actually threaded something. Uh, it, it felt, this was the first time in a long time that it felt like kind of the mid 2000s when you had an app coming out like every other week. Like it was just, there was just a hit after hit and it was just fun. It was exciting. Yeah. And this is like Meerkat Periscope almost, right? Those are actually, I don't know if I included those in my little list that I did, but yeah, Meerkat Periscope, like that whole era of just like the excitement of trying to figure it out. And for a lot of brands, and I think for a lot of people, that is actually fun when there is kind of no playbook and there's no kind of rule book as to what this is going to be and how to use it. And you start kind of hacking even as a user and as a brand and as a, as a power, whatever, whomever you may be, I think that kind of hacking of these platforms in the early days is fun. And I think if you're good at product marketing, you listen to your customer and understand kind of how people are trying to use it and adapt your product to fit that need. I think it's still in the early days of kind of what it's going to be. I think right now, obviously, it's, you know, direct parody of kind of the simplest, most simplistic features of like Twitter 1.0. But I think we'll see kind of how it evolves and how it kind of starts to kind of rethink what that format could look like and what that format could be um, and kind of in what direction they take it. Some of the things I mean, I was a little surprised some of the features they kind of launched with, honestly, like there was rumors that this was being worked on, like to launch kind of without search functionality was super interesting. Like I kind of was like, I thought that was like table stakes, but like that was super interesting to kind of see and to just see how it forced different kinds of activities and conversations, right? Like Mm -hmm. every brand for the first week or two, even still is just trying to kind of hack the algorithm with getting replies. It's a, it's a, it's a free for all of like questions. It's like get my people to respond to me so that I kind of bubble up into the algorithm and get success. It's a land grab right now, right? It's a land grab. It's a land grab, but it is. There's, there's massive. Uh, there's one thing I've kind of learned. There's massive, massive upside if you make that land grab in the early days when the real estate is cheap, and your eyeballs and the ability for you to get attention is easier conceivably than when it is highly competitive. And that's exciting for I think a lot of brands to kind of be a part of, and for a lot of people to kind of see and try to figure it out and to make that kind of that run early on because the upside is just you know exponential. Yeah, it's going to be curious to see. I mean, I almost feel, and Elon's been hinting at this to make Twitter kind of like, you know, kind of pre PayPal days uh, when he had that company X to sort of make it the uh, Swiss Army knife. Like, you know, you can pay for stuff and you can talk to people. And the WeChat model. Yeah. I, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if you pivoted away from just sort of the single function Twitter as we know it now and it became that. And that's why he's like, eh, go ahead, Mark, you know, you can, you can come out with Twitter because it turns out it's not very profitable. <laughs> and that's why I'm pivoting away from it. Yeah. It'll be, it'll be interesting to see how they, uh, people have, you know, I think the whole like WeChat model and like what's happening kind of over in kind of like APAC, I think is interesting. I think nobody's really had that silver bullet quite yet. Um, we'll see. I think there's a lot of, you know, TikTok, I think is making clearly trying to make moves. Snapchat's kind of was trying to kind of do that for for a minute has had some success but i think it'll be interesting to see kind of who makes that land grab to have that kind of one-stop shop or if it becomes more decentralized um in in some ways and like that's just how you know within some regions we choose to operate and you know i, I think it'll be kind of curious to see kind of who wins out there yeah i'm i'm kind of taken back that still to this day here we are you know what, uh, 15, 2015, almost, gosh, almost 20 years after YouTube launched, right? So um, we're coming up on the 20 year anniversary soon. And it's like, YouTube is still the only platform that really rewards creators for creating content. Right. Like, I mean, it, like in a good way, like uh, 60, 40 or 55, 45, like the rev share split is real. Yeah. And YouTubers can make some good money. Whereas, you know, TikTok, the creator fund or Instagram, mm-hmm. creator fund, uh, Facebook tried it for a little bit while, a little while and then failed. T- Twitter is just now starting to reward right. sort of like a sub stack kind of model. But it's like, you got to be, you know, you have to have gobs of Real. attention. Yeah. yeah. Whereas, you know, on YouTube, you could have 
20, 50, 100,000 subscribers. And, you know, you could, you could make four or $5,000 a month, cover your, your nut, you know, your, your rent or whatever you're going to do. And, uh, it's real. Why aren't any of these other platforms focused on monetization? They're all ad ad driven models. It's curious to me. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I, I don't I don't have the answer on that. I mean, honestly, I, I think it's an interesting question. I think they've really figured. I think YouTube has really figured out how to. I mean, I, I think they're seeing threat. Obviously, you know, clearly, like they're looking at TikTok and saying and paying real close attention and saying like, wow, there's people in droves creating kind of this content that are creating real followings. Like these people are establishing themselves as the next wave of like media properties as people. And those people now are where the attention is. And that is what people are tuning in to kind of watch and look for. Do they, does, does a TikTok kind of continue to evolve? I, I think it's very possible. I think, I think it's an interesting point. I, I don't know if I have an answer as to why they haven't moved in that direction yet. Um, but yeah, I think YouTube obviously has had that cornered really well where they're just monetizing, you know, inventory and paying back people. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it's still, I like what YouTube's doing, uh, bridging the gap between broadcast TV, you know, with YouTube TV, they've done a great job of basically being an option or replacing uh, cable TV. And the other cool thing about YouTube TV is you can watch it on the go or if you're on vacation, you know, wherever you're at, you can... It's not like your little TiVo or DVR. And what's cool lately is I've been putting on my TV, like in my living room, uh, YouTube TV, and my videos come up on YouTube. It's like, oh, there's Behind the Brand with Brian Elliott. Whoa. And, oh, there's a video I did with Robert Greene. Or, you know, it's like, whoa, that's cool. Now it's being served up to people who watch TV. That's kind of a game changer. Do you mon Can you monetize yourself, Brian? Can you watch your own ads running on your own video? Uh, I think I can. Everything that I know about the algorithm and the way the IP is stored tells me that I shouldn't be doing that. Because um, if you're sort of eating your own dog food, so to speak, um, I think there's probably some sort of penalty. Yes, yeah, so I don't I tend not to do that. But uh, for, you, just to light me up in the morning and go, Whoa, cool. I'm on TV. That's cool. <laughs> no, trust me. Somebody, yeah, it's somebody who spent the past four months uh, with, a, with a newborn uh, on the couch, pretty much, kind of feeding that child. I spent a lot of time digging into YouTube and watching videos on my television, not on my computer, but watching it as if it's television. Yeah, yeah. And so that, that uh, discovery, right, uh, crossing over onto other platforms is what's interesting to me as a creator because I'm just trying to increase my audience however way I can. Um, yeah, it's hard to get, you know, obviously, like with some of the changes that have happened across these platforms, like a, a Facebook, like an, an, an Instagram to, to that extent, it's the, it's about reach. It's about are you discovering new people to kind of find your content? And, you know, LinkedIn, I think, has done fairly well to kind of like have that. And like there's a lot of their engine is kind of getting better. But like tick, that's why TikTok's working. It's like you're you're seeing content that the algorithm has predicted that you are going to be in, in, engaging with. And it's working really, really well. In terms of like getting your content out the door, I mean, it's one of the few places right now that you know you don't have to have that massive following, and your content can get picked up pretty quickly if it hits. Um, yeah, and that's been like I think that's the part of the beauty of what people have done. Really, you've seen kind of talent explode because of that. If you have good content, it's going to find the right people. Yeah, I, I wish all the platforms. In fact, across the platforms, I'm making a wish to the universe right now of uh, YouTube, TikTok, Insta, Thread, you know, at all, like the 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 sorting functions are really bad across the board. It's like, I want to be able to sort like, okay, who are my most engaged uh, listeners? Like even, you know, if you go to Spotify or iTunes, if you're listening to this on audio, like, I don't know who you are. You like, you have to go over to YouTube to leave me a comment or DM me on Instagram or leave a comment on my Instagram feed. So I know that you're listening to the podcast. It's like, yeah. I want to be able to sort. And it's really, it's not a vanity thing. It's just more like uh, back to the analytics, back to my Nabisco professor uh, standard deviation talk. It's like, I want to know who my audience is. And, you know, uh, if, if it's, uh, if I'm reaching a new audience of, let's say, you know, um, hot moms, uh, who live in the South, uh, I want to know about that because I want to be able to cater my content to them and, and, and talk about the things that they want to talk about and engage yeah. with that group go, too, just as deep, much as go deep with the hot yeah, mom. I get it. That, you know, like I want to know who my people are. 
Yeah. Uh, or if I'm reaching Canadians, you know, uh, up on the like the west coast or the Banff side, like, and for some reason I didn't know Canadians love me. It's like I want to talk more about Canadian stuff. So, yeah, like, I want to be able, to, yeah, yeah, I want to be able to sort and, um, you know, from uh, most engaged to least engaged, like uh, earliest user to latest user to you know all these different sort functions across the board would be so useful. Yeah, there's a um, ton of insight that I think it could probably come out of that and get spit. Like, I think looking at the comments is like the most hack. You know, it's one of the most like interesting hacky ways to kind of if you're producing content that's actually getting people to respond to it. Yeah, looking at those com comments and kind of understanding kind of like what the heck are people talking about? Like, and the internet's full of like insane people, so you got to take it kind of like for, with a grain of salt because like people will say like insane things, and that's not the majority of like probably <laughs> you're trying to reach. But like for the people that are like. Yeah like legit and actually kind of like responding with like somewhat sensible things. Yeah. The stuff that people will say back to you is like super insightful. And I think using that to kind of fuel the content engine is like what smart people do right now. Like that, that is the name of the game. Hundred percent. You got to produce content in, in the first place that like gets people to like actually want to talk and discuss and, and leave interesting thoughts, not yeah. just like, you know, troll you for whatever reason. Yeah. All right. So we're going back in the chronology, back to your story. It's, it's the, it's the 2000s, and you've graduated. Now and, we're talking. Yeah. And now you're... Uh, Jaw rule, ja rule is on. I'm doing yeah. good. I'm yeah. driving. Uh, and so where did you go from there? Like your, who gave you your first big break? I think one of, the, one of the breaks that I had in the early 2000s probably was when I went to, being, when I went to doing college, and I think I had a really good professor or, or teacher at that time uh, who was part of my... Like, you know, advanced psychology who kind of really took to heart, I think, and understood kind of like she saw, I think, in me what I think I didn't necessarily see it myself in that time, which is that I was I had a real ability to kind of be and understand things that maybe weren't necessarily on the surface. And I think kind of that uncovering of rocks, I think, to me, kind of led me down a particular path in college that I didn't go into college thinking about, but I think really kind of led me to kind of like have that in the back of the back of my mind to kind of understand mm -hmm. things. Um, I did really like well in, 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 in school kind of, you know, grade wise. And I think what I didn't do well is I don't think I necessarily had the focus to kind of do the things that I was actually passionate for at the time. And I think that was a part for me that I kind of needed somebody to kind of push me to and unlock in, over, in, you know, in, in college that kind of helped me understand and kind of and recognize kind of what I wanted to do and how important that was and what I was really gravitating towards and help me decipher that as a student. Sometimes it's hard. You know, you kind of don't know what the careers look like and you don't know kind of where your skill sets necessarily lie. And, and, and having somebody to kind of from the outside perhaps, you know, look in to you and say, you really seem to be like your energy is over here focusing mm -hmm. on this or like you really seem to excel at that. Have you thought about this as a kind of profession? And that, that I think kind of helped me get to that point. What a gift. I mean, that's, that's what you want in a good coach, good teacher, you know, parents, whoever can give that to you. It's such a gift. Yeah. Otherwise you're sort of just wandering around. Wandering around. You're aimless. Yeah. I think in college and in, in college I had, um, I had one professor, Dana Saywitz, if you're out there listening. Um, but you were, you were definitely impactful. I think she was the person that helped me get into certain programs and really kind of pushed me and, and kind of, I think pulled me out, um, pulled me aside and kind of was like, yeah, I think you seem to really be passionate about this. And you seem to be good at this. Your writing seems like you're, you, you, you obviously have over indexed in kind of this assignment you've done over and above what most students are doing. You clearly have passion and energy towards that. Have you thought more seriously about pursuing that as kind of a career? Um, and I had another professor, Scott Gratson, who really kind of helped mentor me, I think, as a part of kind of the program that I was in to kind of understand and kind of think more, I think, thoughtfully about, career and but also kind of thinking about kind of that aspect of storytelling and kind of what what good looked like from a kind of marketing perspective and he was more of a you know psychology person but i think even still i think kind of helping shape that was super super important to understand how people think and work and kind of what activities that you kind of really want to use to help motivate them along their buyer buyer journey yeah and that complements really well the main thing in advertising which is no longer demographics it's more psychographics you know uh, it's less about age or where you live, and it's more like, what are you into? Where do you consume your media? Uh, uh, where do you get your, 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 your information? What do you believe? What don't you believe? Uh, and that's all psychological. And it, it was crazy. Like, I grew up in a time, like, 
you know, I was in college. I was one of the first schools to get fa- the Facebook back in mm-hmm. the days. Like, I was the person being in cl- in marketing classes, being like, "Hey, I think there's something here." Like, no, okay. You know, I went to <laughs> my first job out of college. I was the kid who they they brought into the room to like talk about emerging s- this social media thing that was happening. This was like in the early days, nobody was taking this seriously from a marketing perspective. And well, yeah. that was kind of like, I was in college, kind of thriving as, as college Brandon would, um, doing my thing, which we won't need to discuss here, but that was kind of the, the, the time. And I think, you know, kind of trying to figure out being an undecided, undecided person early on and just seeing that and just the kind of allure of what was being created kind of while I was kind of in it, you know, every week there was new features. It was uploading your class, you know, uploading your classes and attaching it to your kind of curriculum and just the kind of iteration that happened and just seeing the potential that really kind of, I think that was the engine that kind of helped get me into the kind of the marketing space and being like, wow, this is actually kind of fun. This is emerging. This is cool. This is disruptive. It's new. That kind of whole mentality, I think was just at that time, kind of where my head was at. And I I saw kind of like what was going to happen. And I kind of didn't start there in my career. I went back kind of more like pharmaceutical marketing because it was the 2008. It was, everything was like belly up at that point. I was just so thankful to get a job at an agency in New York City. Mm-hmm. But I kind of quickly kind of in that position was like, yeah, like guys, I like I think this is like this is going to be a thing. Like I kind of tried to make that case pretty clear. And a lot of companies, you know, kind of were just like not there. Like they that was yeah. just like, yeah, we don't make money. I don't. I don't like we're killing it on direct mail over here. Like, I don't know what you're talking about, but like, right. I, I'm printing these things by the millions and we're making bank. So I think we're going to keep running that playbook. And I was like, yeah, I think I need to go somewhere else in my career. <laughs> yeah. And, and that was the time, even when Netflix was still mailing out movies on DVD, mailing them out. Yeah. I mean, I was like for, for context, like I was staying in the office overnight as a 22 year old out of college in, in a marketing agency. And I, I'm going to be super serious when I say this printing out websites like that is not a <laughs> that's not a euphemism like i was actually responsible for printing out i'm not gonna name the brand but like something.com in paper format and being like oh crap like the logo is cut off between the pages like how can i fix this problem like this is <laughs> you know trying to fi- fix like these things to like get the website submitted to the people that need to approve the website because they can't review it on the online thing yeah. Like it was crazy. It was a wild time. Like, yeah, I learned how to fix printers. Like you learn how to, you learn how to place like toner packets at that point. And like you get buddied up with the FedEx dude who's like, you know, getting the last <laughs> shipment in. Like it was a wild time. That was like definitely the, 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 the pre kind of like mass social days. It was, it was pretty awesome. It was kind of awesome. A lot of things say that's what kind of, uh, and, and I was out of college in 99, just trying to get, my foot in the door and I ended up at the studios, but like that was when I saw or felt it was really more of a feeling like, Hey, everything is changing. And it was Oh five. It wasn't, I didn't really feel the Oh four Facebook thing because I was done with school by then. But it was like in 2005, when YouTube launched, I was like, Oh, this is really interesting. Uh, here I am at the studios and now like distribution is, you know, that's, all, that system is all coming down. The year after, Apple announces iPhone 1, and then, like, all the big cameras are like, huh, I don't need a big camera anymore. I can, like, shoot yeah. on my phone. Huh. Yeah. Okay. Then the next year, I'm at South by Southwest, and Twitter launched, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's actually when I met Gary, and I'm like, this this guy's really interesting. Like, uh, he's kind of obnoxious, uh, but I kind of love him. Like, uh, I, and I want to learn more about him, and that's... You know, as I ramped up into what I was doing, eventually left the studios in like 08 and started doing this series. Gary was the first one, one of the first ones I reached out to. And Gary and I met again at this place called Blog World. Blog World. That, Blog that sort of World. dates it. Yeah. yeah. Blog World. It was, I mean, it's kind of like the the place where everyone hung out. And yeah. uh, I Which remember cool being hanging out at Blog World. That was all the bloggers, man. Yeah. And Gary was there talking about. Uh, he, right. he, had, he had his uh, green wristbands on. He's talking about writing this book that he's going to come out with, uh, like that same year. That was Crush It. And I was like, okay, okay, okay. But like, who are you? He's like, oh, I run this, <laughs> run this wine business. Wine. That's my family's thing. Blah blah blah. 
And uh, I was like, I, I don't understand, but like, I want to know you. <laughs> and uh, I remember being at this dinner with him, too. It's funny. It's like, there's this like, table of you know, thought leaders, and, and I don't even know why I was there. I was just sort of snuck in. But like, I was just like mesmerized. But you could feel it. It was in the air, palpable. Like, change was in the air. This was like when Mashable was really hot. Oh, yeah, cooking. And BuzzFeed. Yeah, Pete Cashmore was yeah. out at the event and, like, you know, pressing the flesh and kissing hands and babies and, like, everything was great. Uh, it was an exciting time. When did oh, you yeah. meet Gary? I met Gary in 2011 or 12. Okay, probably. so that's the Thank You Economy years. That was the right when Thank You Economy, yep, exactly, right when Thank You Economy was dropping. Mm -hmm. That was when I started to Vayner Media. Oh, okay, wow. 150, 150 people. 157th employee, I believe, I believe. Wow. Don't quote me. Don't quote me on that. I but I'm pretty sure it was like 157. Yeah. Like that. I remember that year really well. Like that's burned into my head. I don't know why. It's not not, not something I'm proud of, I'm just saying. <laughs> well, and so it, it how, how did that come to be? Like did you just like throw a resume his way or how, how did that happen? Oh no, they were like no. They were like, yeah, resume like I don't what's the no thank you like not mm -hmm. not needed don't worry about it and it, mm -hmm. which was like by the way it that was like a foreign concept in 2012 it was like what like i just worked like i put like three all-nighters like get this resume like per pristine like printed out <laughs> color the whole nine yards like yeah. in the notebook like in the you know perfectly crisp thing to show you Sp and special just, paper and i walked like in and it was like the hottest like office you could have ever imagined. It was like no air conditioning. They had like a window open. It was like a hot <laughs> summer day. Did you wear a shoot, suit and tie? No, no, I wasn't that. I wasn't that off yeah. kilter. But I, it was yeah. it was kind of those like, what do I wear? Like, yeah, I don't know. But uh, yeah, I I had a, a friend. Um, it was you know I was young and young and thriving in New York City and living yeah. with like three other people. One of which one of the you know girls turned out to be my wife. Um, but yeah, we were in New York City. We had a mutual friend that worked at this, you know, agency. I, I couldn't even understand what he was describing, honestly, at the time, because it wasn't like an agency I had ever heard of. Yeah. He was like, yeah, it's like, you know, we're kind of we're like producing content and social stuff. And it, at that time in 2011, it was or 2010 when I probably sort of first started kind of like really talking to this, this guy, Sam. That was like unheard. It was like, I don't even know what you're talking about, but that kind of sounds interesting, but like, I don't actually get what, what the hell you're talking about. But he was like, yeah. yeah, we're like kind of really, you know, we're managing a lot of people's, you know, social content. We're trying to like work with a lot of brands. We're kind of got some inroads with a couple of clients. Like I, the New York Jets were floating around. Like he was like, oh, I was like, what the I was like, I don't even understand what you're talking about, but <laughs> it sounds really cool. It sounds like where I want to be. Like, I don't really get it, but I, I'm, I'm interested. Yeah. And I kind of, you know, we stayed friends over the kind of years and like, I didn't really feel like it was like the right time and right place. But then I think my frustrations with like pharmaceutical marketing just like grew and grew and grew. And I was like, yeah, like they, I see where this is. This baby is like, this is a rocket ship, but like, I want to, I'm kind of willing to like kind of bet my career in that sucker. And I kind of just made, I made the, I, mean, I just, I just called it. I was just like, yeah, like, Hey man, like I really would love to be a part of like this. And at that time it was like super secret. It was like super, like, I don't know if I'm supposed to be like talking, but like, this was like super secretive. Like you walk in and I was like, Hey, like, you know, most agencies are like, yeah, you're going to be working on this account. Like, you know, this is what you're interviewing for or whatever. Yeah. And in those days it was like, yeah, like we can't tell you our, our, our accounts. I was like, hmm. Whoa, like, okay, that's awesome. <laughs> like, I love this. Like, this is, sounds, sounds really missed. That sounds like really like alluring. Like I'm in, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was like the best sales tactic ever, which was probably like by design for Gary. But, um, yeah, it was like, that is interesting. Yeah, it's kind of, I've, I've, kind of just met him like through like the interview process and you finally get to meet him and see him day one. It was pretty, pretty, pretty cool. I remember those thank you economy days really, really well uh, because, you know, so I launched my production company in 2008. Then, you know, uh, the, the whole economy flipped on its head. All the budgets and projects that I had lined up went away overnight. Uh, I couldn't go back to the, my studio job because people are starting to get laid off by then. This was like September of 08. And, you know, so I found myself uh, going to events like Blog World to, to try and yeah, network, network with people and figure stuff out and like um, bounce ideas off people. I, I really had no other choice. It was sort of less like, I don't know what to do, but I just got to yeah. move my feet, I feel like. And then, um, you know, you kind of get a, a sense of what people are doing. You remember that uh, that app called Clout? That social oh, yeah. app? Oh, yeah. K-L-O-K-L-O-U-C, yeah. yeah. 
Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, that could, that could, idea could draw you the logo, of, could could draw you the logo right now if I had to. Yeah, yeah. And so this idea of like social inf influence or attention yeah. as the asset of, as Gary likes to say, it really uh, started to crystallize for me and I realized, oh, I need to be building a community. I need to be building an mm -hmm. audience. Um uh in 08, uh, Seth Godin writes this book called Tribes, and I got really inspired by that. And I thought, okay, I'm going to give this a shot. And I started putting together little events in 08. Um, it took a year of Seth saying, a year and a half, actually, of Seth saying no. Like, I invited him in 08. Uh, he said no all through 08 <laughs> into 09. And finally, uh, I said something, I think, that, you know, that, I don't know, I don't know what, clicked in his mind but like i think he had some uh mercy <laughs> or some sympathy for me persistent. like this guy's persistent all right uh, if nothing else i'm persistent it's true i have lots of stories to prove it but um he finally said yes and, and seth came out to southern california to speak and it was a phenomenal success i mean he gave me uh, the super high bar because I, I asked him what's it going to take for you to come out and he's like well you can't afford me and I said, well, what, try me. Like, what are you talking about? He's like, well, my speaker fee is 125000 an hour. I was like, oh, whoa, you're right. I can't you're afford right. you. Yeah. <laughs> this is the, uh, did you, did you hear that we're in a recession, Mr. Godin? <laughs> like, I didn't know if, if you knew that, but like, he goes, no, you know, thanks for the invite, but I speak for Fortune, you know, 500 companies, 100 companies. Plus I'm in New York. I don't want to come out to LA. It's kind of a pain. But I knew that the uh, TED conference was happening that year and it was still in Long Beach. And that's just like up the road for me. And so I said, hey, how about this? Um, the TED conference, I know you're coming out. You, you go to TED every year. He said, yes, I'll be there in February. I go, why don't we just build an event around you? And he's like, oh, that's clever. Uh, I said, I'll just, you know, get a limo, pick you up, whatever, like bring you down and we'll do an event like at 7 p.m. You'll do a little keynote from 7 to 8. Uh, and I said, people will come. Like, People will attend this event, I promise you. He's like, really? And I said, this, these are the words I said, what do you need? And, and that changed everything because he was quiet for a minute, maybe you know, three or four beats. And he's like, hmm, well, I have this new book called, out after Tribes. It was called Lynchpin. And he's like, uh, I really would love, this is like one of my most personal books. I would love for this to do well. He goes, I tell you what, if you could buy 2,000 copies uh, in two weeks, then I'll commit to the event. And I just quickly did the math. I was like, hmm, 2,000 copies at like 20 bucks. That sounds like 40 grand. <laughs> uh, and he goes, yeah, it's about 40 grand. He, you know, at the time they were distributed through uh, CEO Reed, which is now Porchlight. And uh, he goes, I'll hook you up with my guy. You know, you'll, you know, they'll take a few pennies off, but it's still like 20 bucks a book. And uh, he goes, you can also uh, send me a non-refundable uh, check um, what do they call that? Uh, cashier's check cashier's to hold the date for ten thousand. Uh, I'll need I'll need that in seventy two hours to hold Oof. the date, and then yeah. in in two weeks, if you can send me the balance, send me the receipt, then I'll commit to come in February. How's that? And uh, and give you give you a deal. And at the time, I was like, okay, uh, you're on. And so um, I send him the check. Damn. Uh, I pushed a button. I had a little email list of like maybe 5,000 people. But again, it was the timing of it. Like people were really engaged. And out of those 5,000 people, I said, hey, we only need to sell 800 tickets at 50 bucks or 400 tickets at 100 bucks. And that's 40 grand. So if you want Seth to come to your backyard, let's go. Push the button. In six hours, I had a hundred thousand dollars cash in my bank account. Well, not exactly the same day because it had to go through Eventbrite. But you know, when I uh, got cleared of the money, um, I had a hundred grand and I bought the books and I showed it to Seth and he's like, Oh, you did it. Uh, he told me later he didn't expect that to happen, but <laughs> he came out and he talked and um, like almost 900 people showed up at that event and it was, it was phenomenal. Wow. And so I was like, Oh, I was a very sort of reluctant event producer. And so I kept those rolling. And so the sort of, the, it's a long story to get there, but like, that's, that's how I got Gary to come out too. Cause in, uh, after I did that with Seth, I was like, Oh, I should keep doing this. So I did it like with Simon Sinek and like some other uh, authors at the time. Um, and then Gary's book came out and I was like, Gary, you got to come out. He's like, Oh, well, 
you know, no, I'm not do that. I said, come on, bro. What's it going to take? He's like, oh, thank you, economy. Uh, you you yeah. got to buy, you know, like, I think it was like maybe a thousand books was the hurdle. How, how many did Seth want? I went double what Seth, want, Seth got. Yeah. I didn't tell him that. <laughs> I, I just said, what's it going to take? And I think it was, it was a $30,000 lift, right? But again, you know, 2011, uh, st still just coming out of the recession, 30,000 bucks in 2011 for me, might as well have been 30 million. It was, yeah, I just didn't have that kind of cash laying around. Like I was hand to mouth. And so again, I went back to my people and by then the list had grown. I had sort of proven the fact that I could host these big events. People were interested, especially people I could bring out who were like hot East coasters. I mean, I, you know, it was more convenient for me to bring them here than for them to schlep out to some conference, pay a big conference ticket, have a hotel, all that, you know, run around versus me just bringing them to my backyard. And so I bought several, uh, about a thousand copies, I think of thank you economy. Gary came out, we played basketball, one-on-one -on -one basketball. Wow. Uh, I let him win. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't tell him that. Good he call. Was, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, he pretended like he hurt his back a little bit. Um, uh, I was like, Oh, I see. This is not going to go well. If I win, he's very competitive. The guest yes. has got to win. Yeah. 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 Hyper. <laughs> like when he, when we played knockout and he knocked out like every single camper, i.e. employee for like an hour straight and like refused to <laughs> it was savage. Yeah. yeah. He's very competitive. Uh, so talk about Vayner a little bit. What did you learn? Yeah. I learned, I was at Vayner for seven and a half years and I learned a ton over that time. I, I think probably one of the bigger things that I kind of learned was just how to run a company. Like, honestly, I think I was there early enough where I kind of saw it. Like I haven't maybe necessarily like used that part of it, but like that part of it is in me. And that's the lesson I learned is like, I think I saw kind of like how Gary built a company and get, got people extremely bought in on a vision. Yeah. Gary has a super strong point of view on things and yeah. was crystal clear about what we were trying to do and building towards. And everybody, especially in the early days, I'm sure it's the case today because I think it's the part of like his DNA and what he's building is that people are bought in. People get what he's after and mm -hmm. you're kind of along for the ride and you're kind of helping build it. And that yeah. I think was like a huge thing as a leader to kind of see that kind of operationalize and kind of what that looked like as a leader to get on stage and kind of speak at an all hands or a town hall about what we're, we're all chasing after. And I think rallying your troops to kind of get behind that mission, I think was like a huge learning. And I felt everybody felt like really like we're willing to kind of like dig in and kind of like, you know, grind and kind of, you know, some of the early hustle culture stuff that was kind of happening. But it's like, yeah, that kind of like was people were like, kind of like feeling it like that was kind of like what we all kind of like wanted to be a part of. Um, I think I also learned how to balance kind of like work, you know, with with fun. I think he does a good job of kind of keeping it light. Mm -hmm. um, he's serious when he has to be and obviously kind of, you know, kind of can be a hard ass. But I think he also kind of understands the kind of fun and part of it's about the culture and enjoying kind of what you do and kind of being a part of it. Yeah. T t tell me if this is uh, on point or not, but like I, I saw his whole culture is basically boiled down to, he's got a huge heart, right? Um, he, he is tough, but at the same time, it's very anti-establishment. It's almost like us versus them. It's like, they don't care about social media. They don't see the value in it or they don't, you know, whatever, whatever it is, it's always an it, uh, them versus us. And it's a counterculture. Like we're going to break the status quo. Like, you know, we're going to be, we're going to be the antithesis of the Ogilvy uh, model agency. Like we, we are a social agency first. We're about content. We're about people. We're about engagement, you know, not big flashy Super Bowl ads that everyone pats you on the back at the end and then it does nothing. Yeah, I think that 100%. I think he had like a really clear, and it, I don't want to say like an enemy, but he had a really clear of like what we aren't and what we are. And I mm -hmm. think that was very clear to everybody and kind of you either were bought in or you weren't. And like, if you were bought in, like you were here to kind of like make it happen. So I think like that's kind of like what I saw from like a company perspective. And I think that's something that I, I to this day, like really value. And I think just, I had really admired because I saw what kind of good looked like in that regard. I think from a marketing perspective, I think you learn about attention. You learn how to kind of understand and kind of like the importance of kind of eyes and ears and kind of how to get in front of those people and where they're spending their time and finding ways to actually 
get paid attention to. That was a real big kind of tenant that we kind of like we're always talking about. And I think I've taken that to kind of what we do here at WeWork as well, which is, you know, what can we can we do to produce and ensure that we're going to get your attention? That we have to earn that. You don't kind of get handed anymore. Kind of like there's too much media, there's too much noise, there's too many things happening for you not to kind of actually do something kind of worth stopping for. And that whole mentality, I think, and everything that was happening and being disruptive and being kind of first mover and kind of being different and being that bit of an outsider in feed, kind of wherever people were spending their time, I think was a real differentiator at that time. And I think still today exists. I think yeah. a lot of what we were kind of in, in the agency was laying the foundations for, and I think Gary was a massive shift in this is just kind of what has now become this kind of creator economy of people kind of producing content for themselves, these personal brands and yeah. finding ways to kind of use these platforms to kind of tell their own kind of story and provide value. Yeah. He's, he's one of the early pioneers. I mean, you could take it back even further uh, to early MTV days. If you want to, you could like, you know, road rules and the Tila tequilas yeah. and you know, those people who got really popular. Um, tried it, out uh, for it, been there, tried out for, for real, real world. Did you? Yeah, I may have. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and, I may have. I may have showed up to, uh, to the Philly interview. Yeah, didn't I didn't make it. make it. I didn't make. Well, honestly, the line was so freaking long. Honestly, the second the second callback line was so long that I was just like, "This isn't for me." I was probably off doing something else. Yeah. Uh, do you have yeah. any? That was, um, that was probably the one of the regrets I had. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I was gonna say, do you have any like guilty pleasures? What are your guilty pleasures? Right now? Yeah. Oh man. You know, this is going well, to you're a new dad, so you're going a little to, bit more domesticated. But new dad, yeah. I think one of the guilty pleasures. Of, it's funny, like talking about the brand thing. Like, have you ever watched the show on the History Channel, The Foods That Build America? Uh, no, I don't think I have. Oof, that's like okay. become my Bravo. Like, that's become like my my Desperate Housewives or something, or like whatever that show is. But like, yeah, this show is they've done an awesome job, which is and I, it plays perfectly into kind of what I love, which is like this business marketing ingenuity of days of old. Like I, I could watch, I could probably sit there and watch like, an ep like I could probably sit there the entire day and binge watch like seasons one through three. Oh, but they okay. tell, they, they this. tell this, you got to check it out. Like they tell basically in a really like the same kind of, you know, kind of model, they do all these shows, but they talk about kind of how these companies that we kind of know and you know, you just think of it's a, you just think of it's like a big company. You're just like, I don't know where Taco Bell is comes from, but like, it seems kind of interesting. Somebody actually created Taco Bell. Like, you know, somebody had yeah. to like think of the idea of like, oh, I'm, the U.S. market doesn't eat tacos. Like, I found this thing called a taco. Like, I'm going to now get them to eat tacos and like build my business on this. And they talk about these kind of stories of kind of these, usually it's competitive, like it's Dunkin' Donuts versus Krispy Kreme or okay. Starbucks versus Dunkin' Donuts or whatever pizza uh i forget came out, like pizza versus dominoes yeah. and chicken chick-fil-a like you know the, the things go on but like they unpack and they the reenactments and they kind of talk about the history and they have commentary from people you know they got like the adam richmond's coming on and doing commentary about kind of like the, these things and like it is just to me like i could sit there all day and like learn about intimate cakes like <laughs> Who would have thought Intimate's Cakes was like a complete marketing genius? Like yeah. you're like you're now you're like oh like whatever, but like somebody was like oh yeah like it should be in a white box because that's what Baker's boxes used to look like, and oh, it should yeah. have cellophane over it, and we're gonna figure out a product solution to put like a clear thing so that people could actually see the donuts or whatever in mm -hmm. the box, which was like whoa like no one has ever done that like no one. We didn't have the technology to make a clear freaking thing. And like yeah. this woman figured this out and was just like a complete disrupting groundbreaker from her, like, I don't know, father's company or something like that. That sounds like my jam. I love that. Oh, I'm like, check it out. Yeah. I go, I can go deep, deep into like the history of like cornflakes, like love, like these, these very simple products. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. So the, the, I have to stop you on cornflakes. So the I, I'm not big on conspiracy theories, but you know they're floating all over the place. So is it true? Can you uh, validate this or not? That cornflakes were originally invented to sort of curb the um, uh, sexual appetite of men. <laughs> it was like a very kind of religious uh, movement to stop the. Uh, I can't speak and comment on the religious aspects of that, but yeah. according to the History Channel, and again, that's where I get my. You know facts obviously but according to the same people that make like the swamp people and whatever that show is but they have said basically cornflakes if i'm not mistaken 
this is actually kind of crazy, but like there was like the Kellogg's and Post thing. Like this right. Kellogg guy was like a doctor who had this like institution that was treating people with medical. Maybe this is where the religious kind of connotations come come to be. But like they were treating people that were like sick, like completely like stomach gut health sick. Okay. Okay. This is, again, I don't know if this is hearsay. This is what I've heard from History Channel. And these people kind of were coming in sick, and these people needed to figure out kind of like different ailments and he was doing crazy crazy kind of things to, to treat them like electric shock therapy and whatever and mm -hmm. one of the things this guy was trying because people were really sick with stomach issues because like the food was awful back when these, these things were happening was pressing corn into like stuff hmm. and uh yeah eventually kind of as like a sedative <laughs> like yeah <laughs> so and like... things just kind of like evolve from there like it, huh. it becomes like you know this guy post kind of stole this idea and he was one of the patients, I think, if I'm not mistaken, kind of at the Kellogg's institution thing. I don't know. I may be butchering this story, honestly. Like, don't you can't quote me on this stuff right now. Yeah, but yeah, like, yeah. it's late we're on just, a we're just it's late on a Thursday. Cooler. But yeah. you got to check it. The, the show is it's worth a watch if you're into. I want to check that out. Well, the same thing happens to me if I eat a stack of pancakes, which is why I don't eat a stack of pancakes anymore. It's just like I'm pretty much I'm 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 out of commission. Like the shop is closed. I don't have any desire to do anything except just sit down and just sort of, sort of melt into the couch yeah it's like a sedative where it comes from i'm not debating it i'm not debating yeah. the uh, efficacy of that like that may be a very <laughs> legit kind of kind of way to get, approach that by like the yeah. anti anti viagra but like yeah, yeah it's kind of interesting to think about yeah have you ever seen uh that uh back to the founder story the mcdonald's story the it's called the founder with michael keaton uh, i think yeah. it's, it's been on netflix for a while yeah yeah that was a plain watch. That was a plain watch, I think. Super yeah. interesting movie. It's kind of like that, that, that. This show is kind of like that. Like, they yeah. kind of do these, like, you know, not with Michael Keaton, obviously. You're getting some, like, kind of actors. But, like, yeah, you're kind of getting these kind of reenactments that, like, really kind of show you what, you know, must have kind of been like to be, like, in the, you know, back room of, like, Dunkin' Donuts's three locations when they were like, oh, yeah, like, put glaze on the donuts. I don't know. Like, put pink yeah. glaze on it. I don't know. One of my favorite lines from that movie, uh, B.J. Novak plays the the lawyer who helps Michael Keaton, Ray Kroc's yeah. character out. And he's like, uh, you're not in the burger business. <laughs> he's like, what? He's like, you're in the real estate business. Real estate business. Yeah. And he's like, that's when the light bulb goes on. And that's when he's able to sort of outwit the McDonald's brothers. And he basically uh, yeah. negotiates them out of ownership, basically uh, – you know, waters down their shares and, and kind of gets them out of the business. And, uh, man, that was a turning point, a really yeah, he, important he, story. Um, they, they cover that. They definitely cover that in the show. I mean, like his, the operational ingenuity of those people kind of in the early days to like figure out the mechanics of how to like back of house that thing and kind of like actually get it like to the, like, where you can deliver food that quickly, that fast was like awesome. Like real innovation, like people kind of like moving the needle in a different direction than, than it was before. So how are you innovating like that at WeWork now? So you're at the helm, you're doing big things. Of, of course, you got a big team and, and there's all hands on deck. It's not you alone, but um, the, the market's a little bit more mature than it used to be when uh, Miguel was there, you know, in 2012 and when I met him at the Chelsea building and uh, and he and Adam were, were on fire doing all kinds of big things. But the market's matured. There's more players in the market. And yet, you know, you guys are still alive and kicking you're doing big things like so yeah. how are you innovating yeah it's a good question i think we're you know i think uh, part of what we're doing is trying to, to to determine kind of how to continue to kind of build back on some of those foundations i think part of what made we work so different and kind of unique when it was kind of you know when, when you were kind of in the early days kind of fanning is is this we've created a consumer brand for a b2b product i mean nobody had ever thought that the office was a, was cool and mm -hmm. that was kind of part of the innovation of what the product was and why we are kind of where we are today in terms of kind of being the, the, the bleeding edge and the kind of, you know, in terms of kind of what it means to be a workspace provider. Um, and that brand aspect, I think, is really critical. And I think it's something that we continue to kind of come back to and come back to. Um, there's a lot of players in the space, like a lot of people are doing co-working and office space and obviously yeah. across the board. There is now. There wasn't back then, but there is yeah. now. Yeah. Now you, you can go in every corner and there's, there's, you know, a dozen kind of, you know, spaces to kind of sit down and plop with your laptop. And I think what makes us really different in that sense is nobody really combines people, places and technology in the same way that we kind of have figured out. You can kind yeah. of go into a, a, some of these spaces and they kind of 
you know, you can kind of sit down and sure you can kind of work and get it done, but you don't have the community aspects, you don't have the kind of energy, and you don't have the kind of real system that has been put together by we work to kind of bring it all together where you just walk in and it kind of works. Mm -hmm. You've got your Wi-Fi, you've got your fully kind of catered kitchens, you've got your drinks on tap, you've got your coffee at the ready, you've got um, all your kind of services that you kind of expect. That aspect I think is really kind of different. And I think we're continuing to innovate with products like our all access products or or, or, or on demand. You know, having the ability to kind of book a workspace and kind of drop down into a, and touch down into a different WeWork wherever you are in the world is a huge aspect in terms of the, the reach that we have. We're having, you know, a huge network of buildings where you as a member can now kind of tap into those and have a consistent experience, like a la McDonald's, wherever you kind of are in the world, I think is a huge, uh, you know, factor for companies looking to kind of standardize um, their kind of what their employees are getting as a benefit, but also for people who are on the road or traveling or kind of need a place to work from um, into these kind of distributed environment. I think the ability so, to kind of think of space as a service and have at a membership to a space where you can have that a consistent experience is, is an innovation. And we're seeing that kind of market move in that direction where flex is becoming the standard by which a lot of companies are thinking about how to operate their workplace strategy, giving people mm -hmm. who are across multiple of cities and spaces, places to you know, really think about collaboration intentionally. Yeah. So is there this moment like we had in the movie? You're not in the burger business, Brandon. You're in the real estate business. So you're, let's, tr let's try to emphasize. You're not in the workspace business. You're in the – how would you fill in the blank there? I, I would say we are in – I think – well, we are in the real estate business for, for sure, <laughs> without question. But I think we're in the workspace. And I think the reason I say that is that I think workspace looks a little bit differently now. Mm -hmm. I think it looks maybe – a little bit more um, about collaboration, about community and pulling people together with intention. Um, and to me, that's a little bit different of how people maybe define the term workspace five, 10 years ago, where you kind of were, you know, going to an office because that was the standard and like that was what you were told to do, sit in your desk every day. And I think now what we're seeing is that people are coming into the office because they wanna be with their coworkers. They wanna be with their community. They wanna have the engagement and human interactions that you can only get um, by being kind of shoulder to shoulder with somebody in, 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 in person. I think that's a huge differentiator of what we can provide to facilitate for people so they can show up and do their best work. Yeah. And I'll do a little bit of promoting for you just because I can, you know, I'm here in a WeWork yeah, you, and I'm you're a testament to it. I can be a testimonial, but like, you know, th there was a, a time when it was cool to say, you know, Uber's not in the car business or pickup business, you know, they, they're in the business of saving you time. Right. Like, so you don't have to hail a taxi or, you know, you can basically schedule your ride or know what's coming. So yeah. it's more about convenience. The iPhone has been the same way. So in many ways, I think we work and just build, building what you said uh, without doing too much like tongue, tongue bathing on, um, on the brand that we're talking about. But it's real. You know, if you're a solopreneur and you got an office for one, you can do that. And you can also hop around to New York London, Tokyo, you know, wherever there's a WeWork in the world, um, and you can pretty much basically pick up and jump in there seamlessly. The other cool thing is if you've got a whole ad agency and you've got 10, 20, 50 people, you could have all 50 people in that office. You could have a hybrid of um, 25 in office, 25 remote. You could, you know, and if you scale up or scale down, the flexibility, I haven't been able to find any other place with as much option and flexibility as we work, you know, sure, you can find a singular building and they might be able to try to accommodate you, but like that's their, their only building. Like, you know, right. they own that and then that's their only piece of property. Whereas WeWork's advantage is kind of like we're going back, there's a McDonald's in every corner. Um, you can find one pretty much wherever you live in the world. And so that's the convenience thing. I think it's convenience and flexibility is what I'd say I like about it the most. Yeah, I think that we, I mean, so many of our members say the exact same thing. I think the ability to kind of have that flexibility and to, to adapt that in whatever way kind of works for you, I think is super important. I think we, we really try to think about kind of all the different ways that people are currently trying to work and, and adapt kind of to meet those needs. We have companies that are, are buying, you know, for the 20 people kind of in one city, they're buying an office that fits 20 people or buying an office that for their, you know, we're buying people an office that fits 10 people because mm -hmm. they want to manage who's going to use that office on every, on, their, on different days of the week. 
and having kind of some of your workforce kind of in other markets kind of have this same consistent experience in a place where they can kind of go into the office on their own every day and have that kind of sense of community. Yeah. Um, and I think the, the ways that we're kind of thinking about work, obviously coming out of the pandemic, there's a need for innovation. There's a need for ways to think about work play strategy a little bit differently. And a lot of companies are kind of rethinking how they kind of do that with different kind of offerings that maybe weren't, um, you know, the traditional kind of long-term 10 year lease that you kind of were typically locking yourselves into. Yeah, it, it definitely has changed. Everything, everything changed again. It was totally reset after 2020. Uh, we're seeing it in our business with the production business, you know, um, just because we, we want to attract the best talent, sometimes we have to have people who live in different cities than us. Like right. we want everyone to be right here in LA or, or South Orange County, Laguna Beach, you know, wherever we are right now. Um, that would be awesome. But the reality is there's someone that's awesome in uh, Austin, Texas or Minneapolis or New York. And it's like, we want them. And they also maybe want an office space. So it's like we, by having multiple uh, physical location options. We have the option to put them in there in a little solo office, or they can keep working remote and then we can have our meetings here. Or I'm, since I'm shooting on location all the time, it's easy for me to drop into, you know, we work and have this. I just had this meeting when I was in New York last time. We couldn't touch base because you were busy with baby, yeah. but um, uh, I had this pitch yeah. meeting out. Uh, at the we work Chelsea right across the street from my uh, little Renaissance hotel right there, um, and it was super easy and everyone was super, really nice and it felt like home because I you know I know how to work the key card and everything looks the same it kind of feels the same it's familiar so there is something to that and I think I'd call it community and you know for me again that's that's a super important convenience yeah and that's like I think that's true. That was true kind of when the company started, and I think it's increasingly true to, to today, especially with what people are looking for. Mm -hmm. And we're, I think on the marketing side, we're thinking about kind of how to continually demonstrate that to other people. Like, you know, when we think about how do you kind of take some of those intangibles and that kind of idea of people kind of working together, the kind of energy and the, the kind of vibe that people feel when they are together working, try to convey that out to the world. And we're doing that in, in a lot of ways. We're looking at our members really critically and saying, you know, you guys are great storytellers too. Like Brian, you're a, you're a great example of this. But how do we kind of find people that are actually using our space and let them help share our story for for ourselves? Um, yeah. be, we're working with a with a slew of people that um, are actual members and using using our space and just simply letting them show kind of what they do every day in the space. The the product is is proof of kind of what it is and kind of I think that is the way for us to not have to shout about it, but let people actually just show how they're using it. Um, it's a great experience and people love it and just trying to facilitate them to kind of like enable that, uh, to kind of, you know, happen on its own. What's surprising to you now, you know, you're, you, you, you're up a little higher on the food chain there, VP of marketing. What's something that surprised you about th the nature of this business? Of, I think the complexities of running a global company, um, that's physical. I, I think that, that, that is, something coming from the agency side, coming from the market, you know, coming from the advertising kind of world and the agency side, and just kind of the complexities that come along with that from a marketing perspective, get, get, get challenging at a company of our scale and our size. Like what? I mean, when you first started saying that, I thought, oh yeah, I guess you're kind of like a landlord. And if, you know, if the plumbing has a leak, you've got to fix it right away or something, but you're talking about marketing. Yeah, there's definitely the, the issues of, a, the, there's definitely the kind of complexity of the, the operations of the business, for sure. Like, making sure, like, it is no easy feat to ensure that your key card, Brian, when you go into a building in Chelsea, also works in L.A., but also works in another country when you go into London or go into to Milan. So I think those, that the importance of kind of the facilities and kind of operational aspects of a company like that, to have a standardized experience, become very, very difficult and complex. And you know, fortunately, we've got the most incredible team kind of working behind the scenes along with everybody else to kind of make sure that experience is just simply works so that mm -hmm. you can, as a customer, have that really frictionless and easy experience no matter where you are and touching down and have the consistent way that the chairs feel and look the same. They kind of have the similar kind of setting. You know where the bathrooms are. You know what the bathroom is going to look like. Those simple things and the consistency of that is very difficult to pull off um, when you have such a huge, you know, kind of, uh, you know, plethora of 700 locations across the across the world. Um, yeah. From the marketing perspective, it, it happens too. I think that's one of the things that I think I've recognized in being in this position and coming from a kind of 
you know, agency background where you're not exposed to the kind of inner workings of a company are the complexities of operating a company at this scale. For example, our website, having languages translate, or, you know, we want to make an update to a website, understanding the implications for all languages and how that has to kind of have a ripple effect of those things gets very tricky very quickly. You want to run a promotional offer in one market. Well, how does that affect in the currency of another market? How do you ensure that the promotional codes that are being used in here and there all kind of work seamlessly? It takes a lot of ingenuity and complexity from an operational mm -hmm. perspective on the marketing side to pull those things off. Are you running it kind of like I would imagine? I know a little bit about the hotel business because we've worked a little bit with uh, Marriott bon Bonvoy and some of these groups. Um, and what I learned about the hotel business is, you know, like Bonvoy uh, owns, Marriott owns 30 different brands. Like they yeah. own the Ritz Carlton, but they also own, you know, these little brands you've never heard of or you have heard of that you didn't know that they were Marriott. But they're individually managed and, and basically run. So, like, you know, New York runs a lot differently than Las Vegas. Right. You might have a totally different experience. So are you running marketing, like sort of, sort of spot market? Like uh, what you see in LA is not what you're seeing in Paris, France or something? We do, I, we'll definitely, we'll run things regionally and by market, by may, by often by country. So we'll yeah. ensure that kind of there's obviously language nuances and there's cultural nuances that we wanna make sure we reflect and kind of, and, and uh, kind of cater to. So mm -hmm. there's different kind of cultural aspects to kind of consider. Um, we've we've definitely kind of, you know, we have teams fortunately on the ground that are really strong in our buildings. Our community teams kind of are incredible and they have a lot of those rich kind of localized insights that they can kind of feed back up to our kind of marketing teams. Yeah. So we can kind of provide them with the right kind of localized materials and, 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 and marketing that they kind of want to do to kind of ensure that their buildings are, are successful, um, to ensure that the local area in, you know, uh, uptown in, in, or Chicago or wherever we may, may be, know about a new building that's opening up or know about a, an event that's happening. So yeah. trying to think, trying to think kind of broad and deep in the same sense, I think is has been one of the interesting things and kind of more challenging things to figure out and adapt to. Um, What's your marketing mix look like? Um, like if you had a pie and you're just to yeah. start slicing it, uh, let's let's like do traditional versus digital. And digital would include social. So digital. like, are you running any TV? Are you running uh, outdoor, in home, billboard, OT? Like traditional versus non traditional. What's the uh... heavily, heavily, heavily digital? Um, so give me a percentage ish. Doesn't have to be exact. Well, we're fortunate that some of our kind of buildings act as traditional so we're kind of we benefit from the fact that you know by having physical footprint you have street media you've got on the yeah. ground you've got kind of large signage and things like that there's but a marquee our, yeah yeah our marketing mix i'd say is 95 percent kind of digital at this point mm -hmm. um you know we've really kind of thought about kind of how to reach people kind of and where they're spending a lot of time um we do do quite a bit of event from an event perspective uh, on the ground um typically those are kind of run a little bit you know, we kind of have a little bit more support on the ground from our community teams who are kind of help, helping kind of execute and produce those events, bringing mm -hmm. in uh, new kind of prospective members and things like that, um, catering to our existing members. Um, but a lot of our marketing is, is, is digital focus for sure. Okay, so then let's chop up digital versus social. So I, I would assume you're running like PPC and you're running Google. You, you want people to find you on, on uh, search engines. What's the mix-ish, uh, uh, you know, digital versus social? Like, are you advertising on TikTok? Are you we're, advertising on yeah, we're, Instagram? We're, we're definitely like across the your 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 social networks for sure. We're you know mm -hmm. obviously we have a lot of we cater to a lot of audiences on on LinkedIn, of course. Uh, we look at our kind of B two B buyers. We're definitely you know we, we definitely see Meta as an opportunity and kind of continue to run there. And then of course like you know we want to kind of make sure that our, our our search game is kind of on point for people that are actively looking for space and looking for co working, being a helpful resource for people trying to find mm -hmm. um, buildings and locations and things like that. Um, one of the things that we're kind of doing that I think is, is interesting is we've seen a lot of like going back to the kind of member um, members, what I was kind of saying, but things that we're doing to really kind of leverage and tap into kind of existing members to produce content um, for things like TikTok, where their voices really carry weight and look and feel like how the platforms are, are kind of using. So, you mm -hmm. know, we've had a lot of success with with um, a, a couple of folks. I'll, I'll name kind of JT, JT Barnett is, is one person that we've kind of worked really closely with. You may have seen his kind of his, his content. He's done great work on TikTok, um, mm -hmm. but continues to produce really, really quality content that he actually was producing on his own. And we just mm -hmm. simply kind of have now approached him and you know, really kind of partnered with that closely to say like, this is somebody who like knows how to tell our story for us. He's a mm -hmm. user of the product. He's done it really well. And yeah, I think I've seen it. Be, JT's good. 
Yeah, and we're going to be increasingly looking at kind of that that kind of aspect of how to create content through kind of that, um, you know, more kind of native native UGC. Yeah. So you're an expert, but is it still difficult to relinquish the control? Like, ah, I just want to give JT a script. I want to give him like key communication points. Like, uh, is it I mean, still that's difficult? like the world. I came, that's what the world I came from, right? But I think like yeah. the reality is, it's like not where the world is. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, that's like a super important point to kind of understand. And I think, especially when you look at what's really working, a lot of build brands are building on the backs of people just simply really scrappily shooting content and shooting how to use the product or how to actually do it. And it's not the high gloss days of old where we're kind of doing full bleed, beautiful kind of like print ads or kind of TV spots that I think that still works and there's still a place for that. Mm -hmm. But I think complementing that with kind of the more raw and real um, yes. that often exists is is the reality of how brands tell stories right now yeah it's a it's a get ready with me you know yeah. it's a hey i'm loading my uh truck up right now with all we're the camera seeing, gear that, and we're seeing that work really really well I mean, we're seeing kind of a, a jt barnett actually sell real numbers on on some of our all access passes as an example um you know i think that that as a means of now communicating to audiences who are paying attention to people not paying as much paying attention to kind of brands, I think is really, really important. Um, and I think that's going to be an area we're going to continue to invest in and probably kind of continue to grow out. I think trying to find other ways for us as storytellers to kind of use members and to use people um, kind of in some of our marketing. And you know, we've been kind of very much kind of like looking out at the kind of the world and our spaces and, and, and making sure that people understand how beautiful and well oiled the machine kind of is. But I think also kind of getting that personal touch and kind of going back to a lot of what those kind of roots were in terms of building that community and kind of what members actually mean to our organization is important and kind of think turning the, you know, putting the face to kind of that brand is just kind of where I see it going. Okay. I got it for you now, Brandon, you're not in the real estate business. You're in the people business. I would have to agree. Yeah, I think it is. I think it's about the people. I mean, we were just sitting back, you know, <laughs> chopping it up, reminiscing about the good old days and all that. <laughs> You know, tracking my roots, where I came from, and 